Tonight on Nation and Nation, the RCMP and its top Mountie face heavy scrutiny and questions about the force's future. What I would call for and have called for a, a royal commission on policing to deal with these issues once and for all. First Nations resist a proposed Quebec language law. One Grand Chief says Bill 96 would be nothing short of cultural genocide. We view this as now another paternalistic uh, bill that will force French language upon our students. And a survivor of forced sterilization wants hard legal consequences for those involved in the practice. Accountability. Um, that's one of the big things and criminalization so this doesn't happen again. Welcome to Nation and Nation, I'm Brett Forster. On Tuesday, RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky testified before a parliamentary committee studying the Trudeau government's use of the Emergencies Act, where she denied the RCMP hugging convoy protesters at a border blockade in Coutts, Alberta, revealed a double standard when compared with the use of an axe and chainsaw on Wet'suwet'en territory. Would you, would you acknowledge, given those two scenarios, the very different state of policing for Indigenous land defenders and people who may, who may be more familiar to police being from their same communities? Can we acknowledge at least a double standard there? No, not at all. Would you not at least admit that there were kid gloves for the protesters in Coots directly after the, uh, the discovery of the weapons cache? No. 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 That was part of her exchange with NDP MP Matthew Green, who joins me now for more. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, Brett. So, no kid gloves. What was going through your mind during this exchange with the RCMP commissioner? I think what was going through uh, many Canadians' minds when they saw the obvious double standard that was, that was playing out across the country with different blockades and the occupation here in Ottawa. Of course, the weapon stash that was found in Coots, the nature in which there was a threat for ideologically motivated violent extremists, was met with, as you saw, high fives, handshakes, and hugs, when you juxtapose that to the way in which Indigenous land defenders are continually brutalized, we have examples of the RCMP commenting in a very cavalier way the use of lethal overwatch for practical reasons in the Wet'suwet'en territory and remote parts of BC. Uh, we've certainly seen rubber bullets fly in land reclamations in southern Ontario and, and in fact across the country. And I, and I think it, it speaks to a level of systemic racism that the commissioner herself has been uh, publicly on the record to deny. How do you respond to Commissioner Lucky trying to explain this mild treatment by arguing there were quote unquote legal protesters at the border blockade who were from the same community as the police? I think in that instance, she said the quiet part out loud, which is why I referred that, you know, th these were people who looked like each other, which of course speaks to not just what I'm saying. Uh, let's be clear, this has uh, been documented time and time again, most recently by the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action. Human Rights Watch has done work on this. The National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, all of these reports reporting to the disproportionate way in which the RCMP uh, treat First Nations, Métis, and Inuit of these lands and other racialized people in Canada versus the way they quote unquote treat people within the communities that they live and work with. Based on these events and based on these reports, do you believe the RCMP is politically impartial and enforces the law fairly? Well, I, I think, you know, it's undeniable what we've seen. And I want to point to the fact that Commissioner Brenda Lucky is appointed and serves at the will of this Liberal government. And so while it might be c convenient to put all the onus on the RCMP, ultimately they are responsible uh, to the minister and the prime minister and this Liberal government. You know, um, there needs to be, and I join the call for the Canadian Feminist Alliance, there needs to be not just an external review of Canada's national police force, but I would call for and have called for a, a royal commission on policing 
to deal with these issues once and for all at all levels of government, not just the RCMP, but the provincial police services and the municipal police services as well, to begin to unpack the disproportionate way in which law enforcement occurs and the way in which police sometimes pick and choose to whom they're keeping safe. Does the NDP plan to push for an overhaul of the RCMP now that it has a little more political leverage? Uh, there needs to be a, a royal commission on policing. There needs to be a reform in the way in which we provide public safety. There needs to be a retasking of um, of duties that have been assigned to sworn officers, to organizations, and to professionals who are more and better equipped for it, i.e., uh, you know, mental health calls and people who are dealing with, uh, you know, social supports within our communities, houselessness and, and other ways in which people are brutalized by police. And, and it has absolutely always been a priority for the NDP to have the fundamental justice, fairness, and human rights upheld for all people living within Canada. Well, RCMP reform and modernizing the force was part of the Liberal election platform. Do you believe that's something the Liberals would call before 2025 when the next election is scheduled? Uh, you know, I'm not going to bank on it. I'll be really honest with you. When you look at the people who are involved, I have on many occasions called the, the, the on the former chief of the Toronto Police Service, Bill Blair, to account for the ways in which racial profiling occurs. Uh, these reports, as you identified, outlined all the ways in which women, Indigenous women, experience violence disproportionately, uh, how the RCMP is a perpetrator of harassment and violence. And yet I don't see within this government a political will within the Liberal government to adequately hold them accountable. And I think that's what you're seeing at committee where we have, uh, you know, police services just refusing to provide even the most basic information for their own accountability. They are denying that their failures have existed. They are discrediting sources that are claiming otherwise, and they are digging in. This is an MO of police across the country. Now, I noticed the struggle to get answers was a, a thread going through the committee testimony. Um, how convinced are you it was truly necessary to invoke the Emergencies Act based on what you're hearing at committee? Well, you know, I supported it based on the information that was made publicly available. I supported it knowing that weapons were found in coots and that an ideologically motivated violent extremist group was embedded within the convoy, both in coots and in Ottawa. Uh, however, this government has a responsibility and a duty to come clean with Canadians on the facts of the matter. And if they are unwilling to provide even the most basic information for why they called an emergency, the preconditions for it, and acknowledge the failure of policing, which again, this is what makes this instant different. Never have Canadians watched live through live stream, social media, and other avenues, the way in which there is a complete double standard of policing. We watched instances of police, the military, former and serving uh, members collude with, support, donate to, sometimes aid and abed this illegal occupation in Ottawa and on these uh, border blockades across the country in ways that you would never see in any other scenario, including in Indigenous land defense or climate actions or labor or racial justice. It is a complete double standard and ones that deserves very close scrutiny. All right, Mr. Green, I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much for having me on this very important issue, Brett. After the break, I'll explore why First Nations leaders in Quebec are resisting changes to the province's French language laws. Welcome back. Bill 96 is a piece of provincial legislation that is supposed to toughen Quebec's language laws. It will expand Quebec's ability to mandate the use of French in public and private life. First Nations in Quebec that are largely English-speaking are alarmed. They've asked for an exemption to Bill 96, a request that's been ignored. A few days ago, students on Ganawage Mohawk territory staged a demonstration against the bill. Ganawage Grand Chief Gazenahawi Skydeer joins me now. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Yeah, I'll go off for having me. So how would these proposed changes impact your community members? Well, we looked at this and there, it's going to have impacts in multiple areas. I think the one that's, uh, you know, been the most highlighted obviously has been in education. Hence why the students felt the need to stage a walkout out of the high school on uh, 
Tuesday this week, and the community rallied behind them. So there was probably about a thousand community members uh, in participation of this action. And it's basically uh, what they want to do is incorporate additional French language courses on our students in order to pass uh, CEGEP and university. So that becomes problematic. I mean, you know, as Indigenous people, we are already subject to speaking a foreign language, uh, that being English, that was imposed on us through the residential school and the Indian day school system. So, you know, we view this as now another paternalistic uh, bill that will force French language upon our students. And, you know, it's going to cause them undue stress. Uh, we did have a... Um, a career day yesterday, career fair, and, you know, just to hear the students and how concerned they are and, you know, a lot of them have dreams and aspirations of, you know, going out there and maybe have uh, a degree in a professional order to come back and work for the community, whether it's, a, you know, a, a nurse, a doctor, and now they'll be subject to have to uh, pass French language uh, at a very high level. And, and that just is very problematic. Aside from education, how would this impact the other ways you conduct business on your territory? So obviously uh, business, you know, we do have, we're such proximity to Montreal. Uh, you know, we do a lot of business here. We have a growing economy. So, you know, people that we do business with will be forced to have to have documents and, you know, different uh, materials in the French language. Uh, let's talk about health for a moment, you know, uh, because our community, although we do have a hospital in the community and a clinic, a lot of our uh, you know, elderly patients uh, have to go outside of the territory to seek medical care. You know, if there's language barriers there, we're already aware of uh, what was reported in the uh, Vienna Commission report and about racism and different things that exist. So, you know, if um, nurses and doctors are, are forced to have to only communicate in the French language, we definitely see some, some barriers and some issues that could happen there um, and, and different uh, social sectors as well. Uh, Health and Social Services Commission, uh, Justice, Justice Services, you know, we do depend on going to court on the outside. Uh, proceedings will have to be in the French language and then we'll have to pay for English translation at our own expense. So it goes, uh, there's so many different areas. Uh, and that's what we're trying to highlight and get the, uh, the CAC government to just, you know, take a pause for a moment and hear the concerns of the Indigenous uh, communities and populations here and why we re are really pushing for an exemption or a carve out that this doesn't apply to us. Okay, I want to get to that exemption a little bit later. But I want to ask, how would this proposed legislation affect your community's efforts to preserve your own language and culture? So I think, uh, you know, we're already on the way to putting in a lot of uh, programs and service delivery and, uh, you know, encouraging our, our young people to, you know, utilize uh, the Ganyageha language uh, more prevalent in the community. And like I said, just, you know, feeling that uh, there's going to be this this legislation or or bill over us that's going to uh, kind of like override or give this view that in this region there's a supreme language above us that is is more important. You know, I think it's the overall mental uh, you know feeling that we have of being ignored and dismissed. And you know, I was using some strong language in earlier interview interviews about saying you know, cultural genocide, like how is it in this time when everybody's speaking reconciliation uh, that they feel that this bill, although wanting to protect Frang um, Franklish, <laughs> the French language ignores uh, the uh, efforts of Indigenous uh, people trying to reclaim our own Indigenous languages after everything we've been through. You mentioned the uh, demand for an exemption earlier. What amendments or what other demands do you have uh, in terms of this bill? Well, we don't want it to apply, and I don't think we will enforce it in our territory. You know, uh, we feel that the boundaries of Gahnawage, and when you come into this territory, this is our own jurisdiction where we have our own governance. We make our own laws here, and, you know, we're not going to have it apply in our territory, and we'll do everything, you know, to not have it apply. So I think, um, you know, there's definitely going to be a lot more dialogue. What I really see happening is, you know, the community is coming together and really discussing uh, the impacts and what we're going to do, because we know it's going to pass. 
there's no doubt in my mind that at some point in the assembly, whether it's this week or next week, that this bill is going to pass. And if there isn't any, like you said, uh, carve out or, you know, exemption for our people, then we have to figure out in our community what we're going to do to ensure that it doesn't apply here and that we further bolster our language revitalization, signage, everything, uh, business in, in the language. And we know we have a lot of people who come here for tourism and, uh, you know, we'll be encouraging them to learn our language just as equally then, you know, I, I think it's time. And as a follow-up, what role should the Quebec government play in preserving First Nations culture and language? And to what extent is it living up to that role? Uh, that's an interesting concept because although there's been talk of them proposing a separate bill that maybe protects uh, indigenous languages, I don't feel like it's a foreign government's role and responsibility to protect our language. I think that's our role and responsibility to do so. And what we're seeking more is for uh, a recognition and a respect of our indigenous languages. So, you know, if it's resources that they could put toward us to, you know, enhance, like I talked about the programs and services, we're about to build a new multi-million dollar cultural center uh, theater museum project, you know, that showcases and highlights our history and um, provides uh, services in the language to community members who, you know, want to raise their proficiency, you know, give to our causes. I don't think it's, it's their, uh, their role and responsibility. Okay, Grand Chief Skydeer, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you very much. We have to take another break. We'll be back with more in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Canada has a sad and shameful history of sterilizing Indigenous women against their will. And it's a history that isn't done being written. Last week, senators studying the subject heard survivors of this horrific practice tell their stories. Among them, 49-year-old Cree woman Sylvia Tuckanow, who testified she was surgically sterilized without consent after giving birth in 2001. What they did to me and my family and so many others was wrong and they need to be held accountable, including criminally, for these horrendous, torturous and genocidal acts. Tuckanow is also a lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit. She joins me from Pipakesis First Nation in Saskatchewan. Ms. Tuckanow, welcome to the show. Hi. So I know this can be quite difficult to talk about, but uh, can you share a little bit of your story and why you decided to come forward? Uh, I got forcefully sterilized in 2001 in Saskatoon. Um, I came forward when I seen other women come forward. Uh, I believe it was three other women that came forward and I decided to all those, all those years I thought I was alone and they were kind of like an inspiration for me to come forward. And what was it like for you uh, along with the other survivors sharing your story before the Senate earlier uh, this weekend? I was honored to be there. Um, it, to me it felt like we were actually getting taken seriously um, it was also very scary um, because we had recently just got our publication ban taken off. So I'm just coming forward with my my story. Now, this study has been ongoing for some time. 2019 was when they first opened it. What do you hope it achieves in the end once it's concluded? Accountability. Um, that's one of the big things and criminalization so this doesn't happen again. We need to protect our future generations. Yes, you mentioned the need for accountability in your introductory comment there. Can you give me a better sense of who needs to be held accountable and how we can make that happen? Uh, the doctors, uh, SHA, the government, needs to be held accountable. Um, 
hopefully getting it criminalized will be a start of a solution. Do you think Canada can be trusted to investigate itself for these human rights abuses, what you term genocide and what many people uh, call genocide as well? No, my answer would be no. I believe there needs to be an outside, outside uh, investigation. Well, recently the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations was at the United Nations asking for an independent international investigations into the allegation of genocide. Uh, do you think that's something that could help in this case? I believe so. Switching to the lawsuit now, why did you decide to get involved with this class action? At the time, I didn't actually think there was going to be a lawsuit. I, I was just coming out with my story, and it and it eventually led to that. Um, but now, being in the lawsuit and being a lead plaintiff, I I am a voice for other women to come forward. And what's your message to other women who may have survived this or may be going through what you went through in the past? My message would be, you are not alone. Um, don't be scared to come forward. Finally, are you able to talk a little bit about your own uh, journey? Um, have you been able to heal at all since this happened? My healing journey started when I came forward with my story in 2015. Uh, it's, it's slow, but talking about it and helps me a lot. Getting my story out there helps me a lot to get through this. Have you been able to get a sense of just how common this thing, this sort of thing is? Yes. Uh, a few years ago, it didn't seem as common, but now that more women are coming forward, it, it's common all over Canada. And do you think this ongoing study, uh, the lawsuit, is going to help bring it to light and eventually maybe lift some of the stigma so more people come forward? That's one of my goals is for this to bring awareness. Okay, well, Ms. Tuckenau, I do really appreciate you uh, sharing your story with me. Thank you. Thank you. If you are experiencing emotional distress, the Hope for Wellness helpline can be reached by phone at 1-855-242-3310 or via online chat at www.hopeforwellness.ca. That concludes tonight's episode of Nation to Nation. I'm Brett Forster, and thanks for watching.